Okay. So we're here on episode three today. Hi, Scott. Hi, Chica. How's uh, life in Japan? Not too bad. It's you, you see me wearing a jacket. It's getting a little bit chilly here.、Um, it's cloudy, a little bit of rain.、Um, but yeah, the weather is much nicer these days.、Um, and a lot of people are actually going out and sightseeing. <laughs> So、wow. we're a little bit worried that the corona is going to get a little、uh, bit, you yeah, know, worse. Yeah. But yeah,、going、this is the、that. season. Yeah, this is the season,、um, best season if you want to travel to Japan because the weather is great. And、um, by maybe mid-ish November,、uh, maybe even starting late October, the the leaf color, the leaves are starting to change. So yeah, it's going to be、yeah. a very beautiful. Yeah, season.、Well, and LA, LA is exactly the same as it was、uh, last year. <laughs> I think、uh, we, well, we we went through a fire season, but、uh, the、That's、weather、right. hasn't it hasn't really changed much. So, yeah, yeah, all, all the same. Although I think it dipped into the seventies briefly today, like seventy nine. So、uh, nice. not enough to put on a jacket. So, okay, I've got some really really great jackets too. I need to move.、Mm. <laughs> The Dario. <laughs> hey, here, here's the thing.、Um, I've got、uh, a whole closet full of these. And, really?、Uh, yeah. Everybody thinks I'm always wearing the same shirt, and it's like, no. <laughs> it's actually just.、Uh, That's、I've、actually、so、what I've been、many. thinking. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> no, I、uh, no, I, I no, I really have like seven or eight of these, and、uh, you know, I just sort of was like, I'm not going anywhere, so you might as well. Um, you know, support、uh, support the company,、um, but、uh, yeah, no. Just just for the record, I'm I'm not always wearing the same shirt. Everybody. Oh, so Chucky saying, "Hey, Scott, what's happening?" Ah,、uh, hey, Chuck.、Um, we are just、uh, <laughs> doing our weekly thing here. Yeah. So hi, to... I'm Chica, and the saxophonist, a, and this is Chuck's、Scott. a rock and roll singer.、So、oh my gosh. That's add amazing. Some,、uh, add some.、Uh, yeah, he was he was there back in the day.、Uh, gosh, I think we started playing in bands together when we when I was maybe thirteen. Wow. Something like that. And、uh, yeah, we we used to,、uh, you know, talking about expanding the the audience for our genre today in the show.、Um, yeah. We used to uh, draw up uh, by hand flyers and post them around the neighborhood. <laughs> Wow! Didn't even have access to to, to print them, and、uh, yeah. So Chucky probably knows a thing or two about、uh, DIY promotion and your own <laughs> audience and all of that good stuff. Hey Chuck,、yeah. good to see you. Yeah,、so、we are. Yeah, sorry.、Um, we we are here talking、uh, about how、um, it, and if we need to, if we should. I mean, it seems like a silly question, but I've had some people ask if if you really need to.、Um, You know, actively grow.、Uh, you know, in our case,、uh, the, the the so-called classical audience, and we purposely put that in 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 quotes、um, because you know, what does that even really really mean, right? Because you know, I mean, we're not just talking about、uh, Mozart and Schubert. You know, we're 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 talking about you know all sorts of、um, you know, modern classical genres and you know early music and you know, all yeah, exciting, so, right?、Um, Mozart and Schubert. Um, where we have our CD coming up next week. Oh my、right. gosh, Scott! It's next week. It's next week. Yeah, <laughs> we've been、uh, waiting for this、uh, for two years, I think. Yeah, for well, for a while. Well, we were we were in Studio A exactly around two years ago. I think yeah, I think、right. that's right. Yeah,、um, yeah, 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 yeah. Because、uh, I was driving home, and the whole left side of the freeway was on fire. That's right,、um, the Getty Center, right? No, no,、uh, it was through. It was closer to uh, uh, Ronald Reagan.、Uh, oh, okay, never mind. It was that、uh, presidential library. Yeah, there, so, there, yeah. there've been so many fires. I can't keep up with the visuals. That's right, right. Well, that, that particular one was, you know, the one that went from Simi Valley basically through Malibu. Mm-hmm. And、uh, just made a, a beeline straight for the Pacific Ocean and took out、mm-hmm. everything in its path and got within two and a half miles of my house, which wasn't cool. But、uh, yeah, and I, I remember the one of the producers on our or one of the recording、uh, engineers on our record, Al Schmidt, lived in an area where they did have to evacuate. He still、right. showed up at the studio 
the next day. He Bless did. I he know. Did. Yep. And, you know, you know, I had to get the artwork out of his house. And we now know, thanks to uh, Instagram, that includes things like Picasso ceramics. So, yeah, save the art. Very yes. good. So, <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, we are, we are talking about, you know, how and, you know, why um, to, uh, you know, grow, you know, the classical audience, but, you know, not, not everybody's, uh, you know, classical music artist. So we're going to be talking about some things that are just sort of general, how to grow your audience when you don't have a giant, uh, you know, PR company behind you and a, you know, multi-million dollar major label uh, budget to, to get the word out. So, you know, we, we hope this will be interesting for anybody who's a DIY artist, independent artist out there. Um, but, you know, our, our focus is definitely the, the, the classical audience. Sorry, and, classical. Uh, classical in, you know, cl classical. <laughs> um, whatever, that, whatever that even means. You and, know, I always felt weird. Um, well... I, I I always call myself I play the classical saxophone, right? To to distinguish myself from other genres because people assume that as a saxophone player I play jazz, you know. That's right. <laughs> and you, I think you also do that too, right, Scott? You call yourself a classical guitar player. It, it, well, it, it, depending on what you are doing and at where, but. Yeah, even then, some people don't get it. They, you know, they say, <laughs> yeah, oh, cl true. classic rock? No, <laughs> not classic rock. I love classic rock, but no. Classic not... jazz? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the classic American songbook. Um, yeah, so yeah, our I, instruments are very, right? It's, it, it's, we're always seen as a, a instrument from a different genre. They, they would not assume that we, we play classical right away especially in right. the United States and also probably most part of the world. It, it, correct. Yeah. Um, I'm, I am trying not to give people a total lesson, um, uh, you know, a music <laughs> appreciation lesson every time they, they ask me, you meet somebody at a dinner party and, you know, so <laughs> what do you do? Oh, I'm a musician. Oh, that's interesting. What do you play? Um, oh, play the guitar, classical guitar. Oh, you in a band? No, no I'm not in a band. Um, like, oh, okay. And then you have to say, you know, classical guitar, and they go, oh, you mean like flamenco? Um, and half of half of those comments say, oh, you mean flamenco music? And I'm like, no, it's not flamenco music. Um, but uh, flamenco, flamenco. I, 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 I've heard flamenco music a, a gazillion times, and I just stopped correcting people because it 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 they'd probably be kind of embarrassed if you. Oh, well, that's what they. Well, that's what they know. It, it, it's fine with me. You know, at least, <laughs> at least they kind of have the instrument sort of in the ballpark. But yeah, and as you know, it's sort of like the Spanish guitar. But uh, you know, and then you just go into the thing, and you're like, okay, now I'm just being boring. Uh, what do you do? <laughs> so uh, it's 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 fine to me. But you know, um, classical guitar and saxophone; those are two instruments that people have a lot of assumptions about as far as you know what kind of music they should be playing. So. You know, for, for us talking about how to expand the classical audience, you know, maybe the fact that we play what, uh, you know, management companies used to consider, um, again, with the, I'm not going to do the air quotes, but uh, novelty instruments, you know, it used to be, if you check out a, uh, the, ro the artist roster for a management company, it would, you know, you'd have one guitar player. Um, and uh, I don't recall any classical uh, saxophonist at the time, although I'm sure that's changing. But, uh, you know, back, uh, you know, 15, 20 years ago, you'd have that one guitar player, maybe, maybe two, something like that. And then you had, you know, 15 pianists and 15 violinists and 15 string quartets and so on and so forth. So, yeah, that guitar player was sort of a, a novelty. And it was always a really, you know, big name guitar player. So uh, very, very difficult to get uh, artist representation mm -hmm. uh, as, a, as a solo guitar player. And you know, classical clarinet, saxophone, same same sort of deal. So the fact that we've been sort of forced to be DIY just by our instrument choice, and then by teaming up, you know, we sort of double the the you know <laughs> the wait what factor. Um, so yeah, so we're 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 not completely on our own. We've got a pretty good team with uh, with uh, Samic Music and um, you know 
nice distribution for the record, things like that. But uh, right, and you know, they, spe us, we, they yeah, and then the fact that they specialize in uh, classical uh, clarinet music and saxophones that was very special that, and fortunate yeah, and that, for us. Too. That's one of those things that you know. It's I don't know. Maybe it's intuitive. Maybe it's counterintuitive. It just kind of depends on what angle I look at it. But um, you think about it it's easier to make headway in a really niche, you know, genre, right? So um, I don't want to offend anybody, but it's kind of like your chances are better at making a living if you're a violist rather than a violinist, because um, mm -hmm. there's just fewer, you know, things going on there, um, you know, and by, by appealing to that, you know, woodwind, single read, those enthusiasts, they love it. There are societies all over the world. They, they buy all the stuff. Um, kind of like guitars the same way. You got guitar societies, guitar enthusiasts, guitar series, um, people who just you know live, sleep, drink, breathe guitar um, all the time. It's very easy to reach those people. Mm -hmm. So that's that's the low hanging fruit. So to have mm -hmm. a genre that uh, to, you know that that does have that hardcore audience, um, that's not who you're trying to reach. You know, we're 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 trying to reach out beyond that. So um, you know that that's what we're talking about. Um, today, but I, I I thought you know one of the one of the kind of logical places to start is you know what what does the current and I guess I described some of it just now but what does the current classical audience look like and not not just for guitar and saxophone because that's again that's a you know a niche within a niche but um, what what does that current audience look like and. And and also acknowledging the fact that it's not it's not the same everywhere, right? So you know the audience here in Los Angeles um, looks a whole lot different than mm -hmm. the audience in London mm -hmm. um, or in you know Madrid or sure. you know you know even in New York, it's, it looks very very different. Mm -hmm. So you know uh, what what is that? You know who 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 is that audience now? And then, you know, how do you how do you grow from beyond that? So my my observation for who that audience is, um, by being in so many audiences myself, is you have a, an older crowd who who appreciates classical music, and um, and then you have a lot of uh, students and other musicians, especially if you're playing a festival, especially if you're playing at a conservatory or a university or, you know, a, a very specific series, you know, a chamber music series or a guitar series or something like that. Um, and, you know, how, how many 25 year olds do you see with, who don't play the instrument, who aren't there with a relative, you know, showing up because, mm -hmm. you know, when I, I was in London uh, uh, on a tour with the guitar trio, a couple of years ago and we were we had a night off and one of our our partners said hey let, let's go to the to the to the to the proms um over at albert hall and it was a tuesday night and they were doing what was it the bach vespers madrigals or something like that and th there was a line that went around the block it looked like a rock concert and the place was completely packed it was 10 o'clock at night on a tuesday and everybody said to listen to Bach. And I, I sort of thought like, wow, you know, in Los Angeles, you would have 30 people in this audience right now. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's not the same everywhere, so. Yeah, well, the, the, I would say the tradition is so different, right? Compared to the UK or in Europe or like also in other places of the world compared to, especially United States, Los Angeles, um, because they've had, like a long history, especially in Europe, in UK, they had a long history of going to classical music, and it's it's a thing. It's 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 such a classy thing, and it's such a good um, outing to go to a concert. Yeah, well, I've I've got a theory on that. Um, you know, my first trip to to Europe um, as a musician was uh, back in 1991. Um, really dating myself. But uh, 1991 for a festival in Salzburg at the Mozartam, and um, I just remember being really impressed with how many people were coming out to the concerts. 
and how it was not the people that I saw at Dorothy Chandler or, you know, the ambassador auditorium back in those days. Um, I saw a lot of young people, saw a lot of people, you know, I was 21 at the time, 20. So a lot of people my age, a lot of people on dates, things like that. And I thought, this is really, really cool. And I, I was asking, um, I don't remember who I was talking to about this, but it was like, wow, it's really different in America. And I again, I don't remember who said it, but the, the, the person said, well, you know, we're used to our history around here because when you look around, you see like there's a cathedral and it's from the 14th century. And there's a, you know, this building over here, that tower goes back to the middle ages. And, you know, this is from the Renaissance and, you know, this building's, you know, 300 years old, 400 years old, you got cobblestone streets and places. So you're sort of around history all the time. So maybe you're a little bit more interested in what things looked like back then. Um, you know, we literally have Mozart statues everywhere in Salisbury. You've got an entire place called the Mozartam. So people are just more aware of that history. Where in California, you know, a historic building is one built in what, the 1920s? I mean, that's okay. that's not exactly walking around in, in, you know, with the ghosts of the past. So I, I don't know if that's if that's true or not. Um, I think, you know, in some places also it's it's easy to go to the concert. You can you can walk, public transit, things like that. And and you know, Chica, you know, you've been here long enough. In LA, to get someone to come to a concert, boy, they have to really want to see you because that's <laughs> that's an hour, two hours in traffic. Right. Um, you know, you it, can't you can't just plan a concert on a weekday at like five p.m. or something like that, or six no, p.m. No. Like that's disastrous. Yeah, <laughs> it, it it definitely is. You know, and I I I have not gone to so many concerts because it was just like I. How am I going to get to Irvine on a Wednesday to see? Or even, even at 8 p.m. on a Thursday. Yeah, like you it, would think 8 p.m. It's, it's doable. Yeah, right. But when you consider being, you know, driving there, it'll probably take two hours. If you're really lucky, it'll take even more right. than that, like three hours. <laughs> yeah, no, it could. You know, it's, yeah. it's, it, basically it's traveling. It's the way yeah. I see it. You're not yeah. just driving to the thing. but. Yeah. You know, you're in, probably traveling longer than the time you're actually sitting and listening to music. If you're and true. If, yeah, true. In, and, in, yeah, and you're too tired to enjoy the concert by the time you get there mm -hmm. anyway, because you're burned out from the freeway. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, so we've got our challenges here in, in California, which is, you know, ironically, the entertainment capital of the world. There's so much to do, but it's really hard to get to, to all of it. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's definitely not the same everywhere. Um, but I, I think I, I think maybe there's some similar uh, issues with growing the classical audience, and I, I was thinking about a few. And you know, I, I don't I don't do it so much anymore. But there was a time um, in my teaching career when I started teaching at universities. Um, you know, back in those days where it's like any class that was offered to you, like yes, you're like, but wait, do you know anything about mechanical engineering? I'll figure it out. You know, I'll teach that class. Um, in anything, um, it didn't go quite that far, but sometimes I was on the edge uh, for sure. But I, I would teach these music appreciation classes and we'd have discussions about, you know, going out to concerts and there was always a concert report requirement and the students would get very nervous about it. And, you know, I would ask them why. And, you know, many of them would say they feel out of place um, in a concert hall. They don't feel welcome. They don't know what the etiquette is. They've heard a lot of, things about, oh, you can't clap there. If you do, they're all gonna yell at you. Or, you know, you can't do this, you can't do that. You know, there's this like really strict sort of thing. And, you know, it, it's very unwelcoming. It's extremely unwelcoming. They, they maybe think a lot about stereotypes. I, I had students seriously ask, do I have to wear a tuxedo? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, right. I, not unless you're the artist and you're in the orchestra. I mean, even yeah. then, it's you know not always. So well, I, I it's true there... though that uh, about the 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 dress code, American people don't really, well, especially in Los Angeles, I guess. Maybe it's a little bit hey, different. California now, casual. California, California, yeah, casual. yeah. You wouldn't want to go to a classical concert in jeans or shorts. 
<laughs> right? Um, well, I, well, no, it, well it, the, it depends on the concert. It, you know, if it's a summer sure, festival, sure. But if it's sure. like a, I don't know, like a LA Phil concert, you wouldn't go with your shorts or your I would, jeans. I would not. I would not. Or right? LA Opera. <laughs> I, I, I LA not. Opera. <laughs> Yeah, you yeah, you I can mean, like no one's gonna stop you, and and luck, lucky um, you're in Los Angeles, y you can do that, and no one's going to say anything to you. But no, no yeah, it's just no, the whole culture not. is very different in Los Angeles, especially. Yeah, yeah. Stop picking on us here. You you, you live here too. Um, not now. You know, <laughs> touche. Uh, yeah, I I just. But I got a lot of feedback from from people, and they they actually seemed like you know you know they were taking the class, and you know I'd play something for them, um, you know a Schubert leader or you know I know I'd always try to play the fun stuff, you know Paganini caprices and you know things like that, and they liked the music. That's the thing is you know I'd always say, what do you think of that? Like that was actually really interesting, or you know the the you know Beethoven's Fifth. You know my my whole thing was always you know how many of you have ever listened to anything past the opening notes, and it's like nobody. So you, you listen to the whole thing and you, you know, give them the whole you know, metaphor, the symbolism about, uh, you know, fate knocking at the door, things like that. And they actually will sit there for, you know, however many minutes and listen to the entire thing. And afterwards, like, that was really interesting. It was like, you know, watching a movie, it's film music. So they're not turned off by the music. I, I just wonder if they're a little bit scared to come to the concerts because they don't know what to expect. Well, they obviously haven't been, you know, they didn't grow up going to concerts. Right. Yeah. You know, I, yeah. I've and never it, been to a metal concert, so I'll be scared to go to a metal <laughs> I was just about to say that. I, you know, somebody, somebody flips on, you know, a, a YouTube video of, you know, a Slayer concert, and you look at the audience, you're like, oh, my God, they're killing each other. What is happening? Why would anybody go to that? But as somebody who's been to multiple Slayer concerts, um, I can tell you that nobody died and, uh, actually there's a lot of camaraderie and it's a lot of fun. Um, so it's, uh, yeah, it, 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 it would be scary for someone on the outside who's never been to that sort of thing, uh, before. So, yeah, I think it's just, I guess the point is if you can get them in the door one time and they have a good experience, there's a very good chance they'll come back. Yeah. If you get them in and yeah. Uh, another fact is that um, people are just not listening to music live these days. They're they're here on their headphones. So, and you don't just mean in the pandemic. You mean these days, like yeah, these life. Like, like even pre-COVID, yeah. maybe this past how many years? Like at least ten years, maybe or even more since the Walkman era. I guess I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> since you don't you know what are a Walkman able... is. You're too young. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, well, it, I, I think it depends um, because nostalgia tours, um, when the Rolling Stones go out, when, you know, Van Halen reunites um, and, you know, uh, yeah, rest Eddie Van Halen's soul, got to acknowledge that. Um, Eddie died yesterday and everybody who plays a guitar, whether you're a classical guitar player, jazz guitar player, whatever, um, is uh, pretty heartbroken right now. Um, and then, you know, just musicians across, he was the, he was a real deal, uh, for sure. Inspired me greatly. Um, I think I learned every note of, uh, at least three different records, but a whole bunch of cover bands, things like that. So, you know, thanks Ed. Um, but, uh, whenever a big band reunites, boy, they sell out the biggest arenas like never before there's, you know, record ticket prices and, you know, so, so that stuff is, is, has been way up. The, the last few years, but getting people to come out to new music that's not a festival um, seems to be more challenging. Yeah, they'd rather pay thousands wow. of dollars going to like Lakers game or something. Well, that's that's money well spent. So yeah, I understand <laughs> that. But um, no, I, I I do always sort of like you know think about students. It's like oh, I don't I don't have the money to buy guitar strings. And then next thing you know, they're, they're on Instagram at Coachella. I'm like, wait, what does a ticket to Coachella cost? Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I think it's about priorities mm -hmm. um, in, 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 a, in a lot of ways. But, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it, it, it is true that most people experience music now on their computer or on their phone. 
um, whether it be YouTube, which is a major place for, for music. And um, also the or, attention span to sit there and just listen to music um, is done less yeah. and less. And classical music, like if you go to an orchestra concert, you might be sitting sitting through like 40 minute of piece without being able to stretch. And maybe for a new audience, that's really daunting. Yeah, I, I wouldn't recommend, you know, a, a brand new, you know, person who's never been to a classical concert, taking them to like, you know, the ring cycle of Wagner or, you know, you know, three Mahler symphonies. Um, that That's a lot for, for, for most people. But um, yeah, you know, I, I don't know. Uh, Sunday yeah, people Monday want concert. more stimulus rather than, I mean, hearing, going to hear the concert is wonderful, right? To be able to feel that you know, the sound waves, you know, <laughs> but oh, yeah. Um, yeah. I think we're uh, the, the recent audience or, you know, the, the generation, especially the younger generation, or maybe even including myself, I don't know, maybe things are changing. Like we're so used to seeing visuals and, you know, things are very moving very quickly and not necessarily, uh, you know, if I, I don't like that stimulus, but like social media, which also I want to, you know, stay away from as much as possible. But those stimulus is <laughs> well, the are... irony of where we are right now, though. With yeah, the social media. yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> but that whole stimulus through our devices are really changing how we listen to mu music and feel music and wh how we think and what we think. Yeah, actually, I was before um, this talk. I actually did a little bit of homework. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things I looked up was uh, the the percentages for how music is consumed, mm -hmm. um, and these are this is from a, 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 a statistics company from last year, and uh, so eighteen percent um, actually get their music from physical sales, seven percent from digital albums, the rest it's all streaming. So you know, you know people are most definitely uh, listening to the music through streaming platforms uh, rather than, uh, mm -hmm. you know, CDs or records or, mm -hmm. you know, live music, uh, mm -hmm. things like that. Uh, but, yeah, whenever somebody tells me that they, they saw a concert but they really watched it on YouTube, I was like, well, I watched, you know, Apollo 13, but I haven't been to the moon. And nor do I, I tell people that I have. Um, I, I watched, you know, you know, people on my TV pretend to go to the moon, but... Uh, yeah, I, I didn't actually experience that myself, so that's not not really the same thing. Um, I, I I think one of the things when people talk about growing the audience is uh, one, well, why should we? You know, I mean, why why should we actively? And I, I I think well, first off, any any musician wants to build a fan base because you want people to uh, appreciate what you do. Mm -hmm. um, not really ego or anything mm -hmm. like that. It, it really you know, for me, it's like, well, you know, I really want to share this music with an audience and the bigger the audience, the better. But I think there's some other reasons why we, we really need to grow, especially the, the classical audience. And, um, you know, talking to somebody who uh, was in a, a, a symphony orchestra management, um, they were talking about their su subscription, um, their their subscribers, uh, season ticket holders, and they were going down because they were quite literally dying off. Um, they, they they were older, um, you know, folks, and mm -hmm. they were worried that they weren't replacing them with you know a younger audience. So mm -hmm. you know you had your audience literally dying off, um, and you know what 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 do you do to get new people in the door? that will you know grow your audience but also not alienate the people that were already there it's a really yeah. tricky sort of thing mm -hmm. i mean you you play a lot with the los angeles philharmonic do you have any insight on what what that discussion is like uh well to from from the from the stage it looks like you know the audience is the the age level the age is you know relatively high <laughs> you don't you don't see much like you know younger audiences in the audiences but um they are trying to um 
to a concert for kids and they're trying to uh, play music that is more um, more like up to date. I would say um, sometimes they, they just, just just put some of, some of the programs in it so that they can attract um, younger audiences. They have also like uh, what is it called? The I forgot the the name of it. The coda, so that they can you know they have times when they can mingle with the uh, the musicians and there's going to be wines and uh, uh, grab yeah. some snacks together and um, so they're they're trying really their best to you know, bring the audience um, to the concert hall and especially the younger audiences. So, but, yeah. You know. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, well, you know, in LA Phil, I mean, they, at least by American, you know, standards for, for orchestras, they, they've been, you know, I, I, I you know, certainly since Essa Becca Solomon was hired back in the eighties, um, I don't remember the exact year, but um, you know, they've been very adventurous in programming new works and commissioning new works. And they did not alienate the that older traditional audience who, you know, maybe wants to go for the for the symphony or, you know, the the the, the you know the the Schubert or the, the the Beethoven or whatever it might be. Um but uh yeah I, I, what what about chamber music, you know, I, again the audiences that that I'm used to playing for tend to be either the older audience, you know, at least in the States or for other musicians, because you're at a, you're at a festival and you know, you're, you've got, you know, however many people in your audience and, mm -hmm. you know, easily 25, 30% of them are, are musicians mm -hmm. that are there for, you know, the festival, then, you know, guest artists and, you know, then friends and families, you know, things like that. And yeah. I, I wonder if all those people went away, how many, how many people just like general audience who just walked off the street because this looked really fun mm -hmm. are actually there. So the mm -hmm. whole thing seems a little bit uh, inbred in a way, um, not, not to be too dramatic about it, but that right. that's not sustaining really, um, I, I think. Yeah. So like, how can we, how can we generate more audiences um, who, yeah, but it, it will most likely be, you know, people who play either guitar, the saxophone or the older crowd. Right. And it's the same thing in Japan here, it seems, but it, Japan is a little bit different. Um, there's a lot of people who appreciates music, especially live music and, mm -hmm. People actually really, they, they pay money to go to concerts, you know. It, but, you know, if you go to Europe and sometimes in the U.S., there are um, lots of free concerts, like church concerts. Yeah. But yeah. in Japan, most of the concerts are, you know, you have to pay at least maybe 2,000, 3,000 yen at least, which is about maybe 20 to 30 bucks to get yeah. in the door. And that's just normal. So that's just the way it is. Yeah. But but it's true um there's so many concerts happening <laughs> in Japan that mm. um if if they if you don't have like a specific fan or something like that or somebody who would always come to your concert um, yeah. whenever you have a concert um, it's it'll be difficult to grab like newer audiences it seems like I, I yeah. would also already have to have fans people who maybe like my friend of a family member or something like that to get started right, right. yeah well yeah that, that I, it's funny you you kind of you know read my mind because I, I i was just about to say you know in a big market you know in a, in a tokyo and a new york and a los angeles and a london um and a paris you your your institutional concerts are doing fine mm. um it's actually really hard to get a ticket to la opera Mm -hmm. um, if you've ever been to a summer concert at the Hollywood Bowl, you'll know that thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of people show up to those things. Um, especially well, the way the they promote is so different. You know, they already yeah. have like. Um, oh, it's it's it, uh, they have you know. yeah no problem no problem. Um, Yo Yo Ma with the L.A. Phil Disney Hall that's sold out every time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, no no trouble there. Um, and it, it is hard. Um, if not impossible to compete with that sort of thing, except for your most hardcore base. But one of the things that, you know, I, you know, really think is important 
is to go out of those big markets. And I'm, I'm thinking about one of the first tours I ever kind of did on my own as a solo guitar player. Um, it, it was back when I had my first record in Vacation come out. And I, I started in California and I played mostly uh, Borders bookstores when that was a thing. And we had the CDs sent ahead and, you know, they had the whole thing with, you know, get a signed copy and then I'd play. And there were consistently, you know, 30, 40, 50, 60 people at every single one of these. And the best turnouts were always in like, you know, Champaign, Urbana, Illinois, or Columbia, Missouri, or, you know, it, it wasn't, you know, Chicago. It, it was, you know, halfway between Chicago and, you know, Indianapolis or, or something like that, or Dayton, Ohio, just these places that you wouldn't think of necessarily as, you know, arts meccas um, actually have a really hungry audience there. And they, they would love uh, to come see a play. It's actually pretty easy to attract audiences in those places. Um, so, you know, that's one thing I think a lot of DIY musicians should, should do is don't don't just book the big cities those are hard and you know like chica said you know unless you have a fan base in that city already having somebody uh come to your concerts is going to be you know difficult but if you go to a smaller market where there's not as much you know uh, uh i don't want to say competition it's the wrong word i can't think of a better word right now though so sorry um it's it's so much easier to get an audience and they're so appreciative um, and you know, that's also where you're going to sell most of your, if you're still you know, having physical CDs, that's where you're going to sell them. Um, you're not going to sell them any other way. Mm -hmm. uh, that's your, that's your shot. So yeah, uh, those, those smaller market tours, um, I think they're a lot of fun also. Mm -hmm. Also, and, you know, just to be really practical about it, not that, you know, I want to go off on some like touring management seminar thing here, but, um, you know, for instance, you know, back in London or, uh, you know, if you're in San Francisco playing um, and you don't have a, a festival putting you up or if you don't have a, you know, maybe a, a friend putting you up and you're paying for a hotel and all that stuff, man, your bottom line gets cut into real fast. <laughs> um, I think, uh, you yeah, know, that tour we did, we played the Bath Festival, a few other things. Just a couple days in London in a hotel and, you know, like half your money's gone. You know, <laughs> it's like, well, wait a minute. So uh, it's cheaper to uh, tour um, sort of off the beaten path is my point. Mm -hmm. So it, it can be more financially uh, successful and sure. you'll have a greater audience come out. Um, but, you know, what are some of the ways, I mean, I guess we've been sort of saying that, you know, if, if we could just get the word out, then the audiences will come. But I, I think a lot of the burden falls on artists and how they present themselves. Mm. And if you are an artist and you have a 25 year old headshot in a awkward tuxedo in black and white, um, and, you know, sort of a weird smile and bad lighting, um, you really can't expect, you know, generation Z to come flocking to you. <laughs> um, you know, just be based on your musical genius, which may very well be there, but they can't tell. So, um, image what, matters. <laughs> image matters. I, mean, I was going to quote Andre Agassi from um, a uh, rather old, uh, I think it was a, a, a camera commercial, but it was image is everything. And, mm -hmm. you know, we do live in a very, very visual society very visual and I, I, you know, I guess this has been going on for a long time, but I'd, I'd like to think that it, it probably started with MTV, um, you know, cause you, you had all those bands that did really, really well when it was mostly radio and you couldn't see them. And then suddenly they're on MTV and it's like, Ooh, look at these guys. And mm -hmm. they didn't do so well. And all the, all the pretty boys and girls start doing really well because the music mm -hmm. becomes more of a visual medium. And I, I, I think we're that on steroids now with YouTube. So, you know, yeah. is that is that lame to, you know, 
you know, have the slick photos and dress real cool and, you know, be in a cool location and, you know, kind of, kind of pop star type stuff um, in order to bring in that new audience. And I, I think not, I, I think, you know, you shouldn't be too, if that's not you, then you shouldn't do it. You know, it needs to be something you're well, with, well, but. you have to be genuinely you. That's that's oh, the sure. um, that's what we talk about all the time, right, Scott? How we how genuine we have to be when we're in front of the audience, and um, if, if you're faking, they're the audience will know. If you're not liking the music you're playing, they're gonna know. Right, right, yeah. yeah or if, if somebody dressed you up against your will in an outfit you didn't want to wear, then they're gonna figure <laughs> that one out too, because you're gonna you're gonna not feel really comfortable. Um, out there, but yeah, I, I think, you know, and I, you see it more and more, some too much, I think, but there are a lot of young artists out there, you know, if you look at their, their, their press photos and things like that, they, you really wouldn't know necessarily that they were classical artists, you know, they might be, you know, you know, more commercial music, um, you know, it could be jazz, something like that, but just trying to make it look, you know, younger, a little bit more hip, things like that. Um, I, you know, crossing over into different genres, you know, Yo-Yo Ma, you know, he's not exactly young and, you know, up and coming or anything like that. He's been around as long as I can remember, but, you know, he's great at, you know, working with non-classical musicians and, you know, jazz and, and rock and pop stars and you know, all sorts of stuff. Just, just a kind of, you know, the whole Silk Road project that he did is real cool. The Tango record that he did with the Assad brothers at Brazil, that's real cool. Um, yeah, just it, you th know, that as, stuff helps too. Yeah, so as the um, audience is, you know, they they have so many pools of music to listen to. Um, we one as a classical musicians, we oh, sure we have to play music we like to play, genuinely love to play, but at the same time, be creative and be flexible too. Um, to you know, get get a different side of that that classicalness that we have i think um because yeah sure we can keep playing the schubert and um uh well mozart the way it's been written for piano but the reason why you and i um arranged it for the saxophone and the guitar is so that people could possibly have a different angle um for our yeah. instrument and the music sure. possibly you know possibly yeah 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 um, yeah, well, I, again, you know, as a, as a guitar player, um, I, I, I will say that the audiences for classical guitar concerts look very different than the audiences for say string quartet concerts. Um, you know, there are some similarities, but you, you do tend to see a lot of younger people and there are a lot of people who like the classical guitar, um, that don't necessarily like any other classical music whatsoever. There's just something about acoustic guitar that's very familiar. Um, where maybe a string quartet or a brass quintet or something like that, just they just can't relate to that in, in the slightest. Um, but like I said, I did my homework before this, so I've got another statistic here. And um, I looked up, uh, the, the most recent uh, study on this I could find was from 2018, which you know seems like about four centuries ago, but uh, 2018 really wasn't that long ago, believe it or not, a year and a half ago. And they... Uh, asked people what types of musical genres they liked. And, you know, this wasn't one of the, you know, you know, pick one kind of thing, but they kind of went down the list and, you know, people would say, oh yeah, yeah, I listen to that. Or you know, I, that's in my playlist or that's in whatever. And, um, you know, not, not surprisingly country, uh, hip hop, uh, rock, um, things like that. Those were all right at the top. You know, um, out of a thousand respondents, um, you know, something like overwhelmingly 60, 70 percent of people said yes to, to those particular genres. But, um, you know, this is kind of interesting. Is this this surprised me a little bit out of those one thousand respondents, 17.4 percent said classical and opera. And it, at first I thought, well, that's not very much, but then it said um, underneath that at 16 something percent said heavy metal. I'm like, wait a minute. So you're trying to tell me classical music is more popular than heavy metal. Um, I, I, first off, I'm not sure that's true, but that, that is what the, what the study did show. I don't know who they were asking, how they got their, their respondents, but 
you know, that, that did tell me, you know, it, it wasn't single digits. It wasn't 1%. It wasn't 2%. It was nearly 18%, um, you know, which is almost, if you're being super optimistic and you're rounding things up, one in five people are, are listening to some classical music and they're open to it. And it, so that, that's, that's one in five people um, who could be a potential fan who could be a person in a seat, who could be, you know, somebody listening to your music online or buying your, your latest CD. Um, again, you're not getting close to, you know, hip hop and, you know, things like that, but, you know, that's okay. That's okay. Mm. But I, I think it's, it's better than I thought. Mm. I, I think the, the, the line where what's classical and what's not classical is sort of being a little blurry sometimes. Um, I don't know if like game music, for example, would those be considered classical music is, you know, a, as a genre, like there's so many genres now, like I'm looking at um, Grammys and there's so many genres I, I, I can't really identify, right? Um, yeah. And even and the term class... Yeah, 57 yeah. subgenres, just bluegrass. <laughs> yeah, so Sorry. even just like classical, like there, there's some music that I, I can't even define whether that particular piece is classical or not. So like film music, um, yeah. you know, could be, could be under classical music, um, I, game I, music. I, yeah, I, I, I believe so. Um, talking to um, composers who are write, you know, sort of expansive um, symphonic music. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, they, they're, they're much more interested in writing for video games and writing, you know, for movies um, right. than they are in writing for the concert hall because, you know, that's where those audiences have gone. And that's um, where the money is. <laughs> that's where the money is. Absolutely. A, a, yeah. You know, a good uh, buddy of mine, uh, Carlos Rafael Rivera, um, who I've known, that we met at a guitar competition in Connecticut when we were both like 17 or 18 or something like that. The Daddario competition, as a matter of fact. Um, I only made the semifinals. I think he got to the finals or something like that. But but it was it was Brower, and he's Cuban, so that's not fair. Um, so, yeah, Carlos, he's he he composes 100% of the time now. And um, yeah, he's, he's, gosh, uh, done music for, you know, Walk Among the Tombstones, Liam Neeson. He's, you know, does all the music for a Netflix series. I'm blocking on the name of it right now. Um, yeah, video game music, all sorts of stuff. He's, he's really busy um, in that area. So I, I, I think, I think that's definitely, uh, if you want your music to be heard, um, you know, as a, as a composer, even as a songwriter, you know, just getting, you know, sync license deals, uh, for, for film, television, um, you know, things like that. So there, there, there is an audience that's not necessarily, um, you know, a live audience, uh, to, to be had and, and in a way that does make up for things like diminishing record sales and all of that. So mm -hmm. yeah, if you can, if you can license your, your music to you know Netflix or something like that. Um, there's there's actually money to to be made there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and yeah. Um, I think it was last week uh, we got a question about whether uh, correct me if I'm wrong um, whether jazz players should um, what, was it something about ja jazz players uh, shall jazz was, players. Uh, sorry, I'm blanking. I, I think out. that was uh, it was uh, Javier de los Santos mm -hmm. who asked the question, mm -hmm. and it, it, I think it had something. I, I remember it's along the lines of if you study classical music, thing you can play anything or or something like that, um, mm, or vice versa, I, I, right? Yeah, I, yeah. I, I mean, it's a funny thing how we already draw a line between those two genres and, and and it is very different considering the fact that one which is a classical like you read everything all the notations are on there how how loud you play how slow you play you know that the tempo everything is on there versus on jazz or even pop tunes 
-hmm. you know, it's, it's written very minimally. And, but there's so much happening between the two notes that are simply written in the jazz yeah. or in the pop. And, and, yeah. And I, I think, I think jazz, it, you know, jazz musicians um, now are, are realizing um, many um, are realizing they, they have a lot more in common with classical music than they thought. Um, jazz being taught at conservatories and universities, just like classical music, get degrees in jazz studies, um, things like that, you know, jazz festivals. Um, it's not just like cool clubs in, you know, Chicago and St. Louis and New York and, you know, places like that. But, um, you know, and then there's also, they, they have to deal with the, 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 the traditional, just, just like we do, you know, um, very, very, uh, uh, good jazz musician that that you and I both work with I'm not going to name because I don't want to out him but uh yeah he he takes offense that big band is even considered jazz he just sees that as like some old relic from the past he doesn't want to do it he's trying to keep it hip and you know current and all of that mm -hmm. stuff but trying to mm -hmm. trying to fight you know the mm -hmm. old and bring in the new while maintaining your integrity and he mm -hmm. sees that as a way to grow the jazz audience so he'll do something like combining a bebop you know um musicians work with you know trap music and mm -hmm. he'll you know he'll kind of mash that whole thing up or you know it, he'll just come up with like new spins on things kind of like you were talking about with you know arrangements of schubert for guitar and saxophone as a way to you know do we really need another you know string quartet version of something that's been recorded eight thousand times by every string quartet in the world, unless you can do something new with it, what's the point? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, also classical music, we do, you know, we do have a history of improvisation that we've gotten away from. And, you know, it, it, it maybe, you know, getting off of the page and reading the dots with all of the instructions and having it be more in the moment um, is a way to expand the audiences. I think about um, the great Roland Dion's the French guitarist and composer who, who would open every concert with an improvisation, mm -hmm. um, just completely improvised. He was a brilliant improviser. Andrew York uh, does the same thing. Um, yesterday, I was moderating a masterclass with Pepe Romero um, on Zoom, of course, and uh, a student played uh, Francisco Tarraga's Lagrima, which of course means tear in, in Spanish. And yeah, He's um, my student. <laughs> <laughs> ah, yeah, that student is. He, he, yeah, he, so he said, do you, you know, do you know that that uh, Targa actually improvised that piece? He was in London and he was um, at uh, intermission uh, for a concert, and he was very, very homesick. And he came back to start the next section of the concert, and he improvised this piece like in front of the audience. Now, I didn't know that. Um, that that that's a that's a beautiful. Um, sort of thing, but you know, just things like that. Rather than you know, a bunch of musicians on stage staring at a score, trying not to mess up, um, but to make it more vibrant, more in the now, um, I, I think is another thing um, classical artists should be doing. I know that's that's you know that's easier for soloists and small um, ensembles than it is for larger ensembles, but um, you know. That's the sort of stuff as an audience member I really like, and it's really exciting. And you kind of feel like, you know, you're you're here for something special that you couldn't get necessarily on a record or on YouTube because they're they're creating this right here now for you, and they're never going to do it this way ever again. And I, I think that's one of the greatest arguments for you know live music ever, which is, you know, this this is only going to happen here once. <laughs> Very well said. <laughs> did I did I win? Did I win? Did, did I win? What did I win? Did, yay! Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, no, it's 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 very true. And um, sorry, I I I, I need to come back. <laughs> Up Chica, Chica's been up all night playing scales on arpeggios. <laughs> it's a, it, once she gets practicing, it's impossible to get her to stop. Oh boy! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, um, mm, 
Uh, where was I going to go with? Um, yeah, so improvisation. Yeah, so we 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 as a we we can't always blame the audience, right, for not listening to classical music. <laughs> it's, oh, I, it's, I think it's the all burden on, is entirely it's, on us. It's, it's, it's on all us. entirely on us. And that's that's especially what I wanted to emphasize today. Like we can't really feel like, oh, you know, it's classical, so we won't have an audience. We can't have that kind of attitude. We have to be hungry about how can we get them listened to and how, you know, not 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 in the sense like we're gonna educate them, but um more in a sense like, you know, here's what what it is and you know, I, I want you to feel you know. A little, yeah, a bite of some new taste, <laughs> yeah. and that's what I feel about um, my uh, our programming. And whenever I do my saxophone concert, I try to program music that way. Um, and and I hope um, those of you who are listening, uh, when, when you get the get get our album, you'll see that you will. There are pieces you recognize, definitely recognize, and the piece that you may have not or may have recognized. So yeah, it's 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 about how can we have that angle? How how do we program music? So it will be interesting. Yeah, but I I think classical mu musicians could learn a whole lot about DIY uh, songwriters, rock bands, things like that, um, because they you know they are they are experts at getting uh, people Attention. to those gigs. <laughs> They know how to get your attention, for sure. Um, yeah, they they most definitely do. Some, Have long hair and way. like long dyed hair, and you know all I, spiky I, yeah, things pyro, like pyro, sticking out. Pyrotechnics, <laughs> yeah, pyrotechnics, um, yeah, all sorts of stuff. The, the answer is always light things on fire on stage. Um, but uh, no, no, but they're they're very good. Um, many um, at you know setting up a, a club date and then making sure. You know, you know, everybody gets the word that this thing is happening, and you know, that that is something that a lot of my 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 classical friends aren't particularly good at. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's something I've noticed, yeah. and I I and I don't know what it is. I mean, you said it's not the audience's fault, um, and it, it is easy to sort of like, oh, we're we're classical musicians, and people don't get us, and you know, they're never going to, and, you know, you can't, you know, it's a McDonald's culture and you can't expect them to appreciate good food and, you know, just kind of like throw your hands up and give up. But that's a defeatist attitude. Um, I, 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 that sort of thinking is, it doesn't really get anywhere. It's not constructive. The, the, the attitude has to be, we believe in what we're doing. And if we can get people in the door, then I bet we can get them to come back. And that's how, you know, you turn 20 people, um, you know, at, at your first concert into 40 people at your next concert, into 100 people at your next concert, and so on and so forth, um, is by, you know, just continually uh, uh, bringing people in and then showing them something once they, once they get there. That's what rock bands do. Mm -hmm. You know, I, when I played in bands, I, I, I knew if I can get someone in the door to see us, they're going to be blown away and they're going to come back every single time they see our you know, name on a flyer. That was absolutely the attitude every single time. Um, unapologetic, no doubt that that was, that was where it was. And I just think if, if classical artists, rather than falling back on, Oh, they don't get us, uh, you know, you know, maybe they'll come, maybe they won't, you know, I, I don't know. Um, I, I felt that way as a classical musician in the past. I know what that feels like. And I just don't think we can afford to do that anymore. Absolutely not. Yeah. 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 So time to put the hype back in uh, classical music. <laughs> yeah. You know, we, we're, we're all in practice. We've always been in practice room practicing pages after page and notes, <laughs> you know, reading all the notes on the page. And we, we've been busy doing that. <laughs> you know and no one taught us how to market ourselves and how to get right. out there and um put a concert out we we've only kind of been in this well especially for those who 
were an institution and studied in, in an institution where you study classical music. It's it, yeah. it seemed like it was very. Um, how do you I say? had zero zero classes on marketing, promotion, mm -hmm. um, artist management, tour, mm -hmm. um, nothing. You you nothing. learned everything from watching your teacher and yeah. what they did. That right. that was that was everything. Um, mm -hmm. Fortunately, that's changing. You know, now a lot of music programs are requiring at least a few classes in music industry, and most most of those um, are around sort of uh, marketing promotion, uh, DIY, you know, musical entrepreneurship, uh, things like that. Um, you know, at least at least here in the LA area, that's the case. Um, yeah. University but at the same time, there's so many information out there that if you are starting out, if you just got out, get out of um, university as a musician, like, I, it's like, like you said, there are courses offered, but there's there, at the same time, there's so many information. And, yeah. and, you know, that the, the fact is, it doesn't, it's, it's not like it'll fit for everybody, right? It, it has like oh, different. No, no. Yeah, for sure. Um, and yeah, yeah, there's so much available. Just, you know, type into Google how to, you know, book a tour or how to set up a publishing company or, you know, what, 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 what is a licensing deal in, in music or, you know, anything like that. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you know, but if, 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 if you are at, if you are a student at a conservatory or a university, um, at this point, I think it's, it's, you know, that program is obligated to at least teach us something about right. that. Um, you know, it's, it's ridiculous considering that's actually going to take up so much of your time once you graduate that nobody ever mentioned this. Mm -hmm. Not once. They, they, they told you if you play scales and arpeggios and phrase a beautiful melody, <laughs> that, uh, you'll be able to make a living. And it's like, well, yeah, but how do I get people to come hear all of that? Mm -hmm. And uh, that's, a, that's at least worth, you know, a, a, a small percentage of your degree mm -hmm. uh, units. So, and yeah, and of course, you know, there was a lot of stuff online, but sometimes there's so much stuff online, you, you don't know where to begin. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. And, nice, nice and to look for specifically what to do as a classical musician. Yeah. Um, is very difficult to find. So learn from what rock stars are doing. <laughs> I guess that's the key. Number one, um, maybe. Well, up and coming rock stars. <laughs> up and yeah, coming the, rock the old, stars. The old rock stars, they, they weren't doing it themselves. They labels and management. Because the like truth that. is what, what worked for our teachers doesn't work for us anymore. Or, you know, the and things are already changing. What worked for me and even for you doesn't work for our students anymore. Yeah, that that's, that's true. Um, and yeah, so, so many of them um, are doing things uh, that uh, I, yeah, I would have never thought of. Um, I mean, I guess we're kind of doing it here. Not, not, not entirely, but um, I'm surprised by the number of young musicians uh, who, who have gone through our university or I meet at, you know, festivals, you know, teaching elsewhere. And they all seem to have a podcast, every single one of them. Um, don't, don't know, <laughs> you know, that's impressive. If that's a, yeah, it, it is, you know, yeah. uh, seen quite, quite a few and they're, they're quite good. Um, yeah. They're, they're very savvy when it comes to video content, um, doing things on their own. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, social media, they're all wizards when it comes to, to that. And yeah, you know, when I was graduating from from college, yeah, yeah I mean, there there was none of that. Mm -hmm. There was none of that. You know, I was mm -hmm. booking, you know, tours across the Midwest and you know, Borders bookstores and you know, colleges and things like that. You know? mm -hmm. um, yeah. So yeah, th time, times change for sure. But I think the materials and how you present yourself um, that 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 will never change. So you know, what what that image that you put out there. Um, that is the authentic you as an artist um, with music that you believe in will always attract an audience. That, yeah. is, that is my, yes, no, that, that is my uh, seven month old Siberian Husky who is very excited that uh, it's, it's almost time for us to sign off here and we'll probably get a nice long walk. <laughs> She can she can sense that hour. <laughs> you you're training her very well. <laughs> no, she's training me. I, I, we've got it all we've got it all backwards here. 
uh, I was kind of hoping she'd do a cameo or something, but she, <laughs> she, she seems to know if I'm on camera mm -hmm. um, in a Zoom meeting or something like this, she just stays mm -hmm. away. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. But she did push the door open, so sorry about that. So, yeah, um, I think this whole talk about how do we grow the classical audience is going to be like an on, ongoing quest for us. But we hope that um, who um, the listeners here, the, the viewers here, would listen to our um, CD that's coming out next week and possibly hear, um, you know, get something out of it, you know. Not everybody's gonna like it, I know, you know. But we we're hoping that, like, we we sure love it. We we all love we we love that CD and, um, and you know maybe that's not the kind of saxophone sound that you were hoping to hear or the the guitar sound that you were hoping to hear, but um, we love our sound so much, and we yeah. we we love the blend of the uh, the, the two instruments. So, yeah, hopefully yeah. you all, you know, get to listen to it. and Yeah, hopefully. absolutely. Yeah, well, you know, thank you, um, everybody, for coming. And, you know, we, we've, we've been noticing that our, our, our weekly talks here get a lot of attention um, after the broadcast. We get a lot of people commenting and, and, and viewing, uh, not live, but, uh, you know, if you're watching this, uh, you know, it's not really a rebroadcast, but if you're not watching this live, um, we, we, we'd like to encourage everybody to, to come to us at our seven o'clock uh, Pacific time um, Wednesday night and, you know, take part in the chat. We, we mentioned last week we're working on moving to a new format. Um, we're, we're not quite sure what that is, but you know, one that would have a more dynamic chat function, things like that. Yeah, so we, we're, we're, we want to move this chat over to YouTube. And uh, we will probably start doing that next week, I want to say, yeah, I because so. next, so. yeah, next Friday is our big release date. So we're hoping that we can get started with our, um, you know, start, it, start the week, uh, yeah. next week with uh, the YouTube. So, you know, we, we, can, we can all talk on that yeah. platform. Great, great. Okay, well, thank you, everybody, and we will be here next week as well. Um, I'm not allowed to leave the house, so I, I'll definitely be here. Um, <laughs> so we hope that you'll join us. And again, uh, we hope that you'll join us live and, and not just watch the video um, afterwards yeah. as the recording. But uh, yeah, the more of you here during, uh, the more fun it is for us. It helps steer the conversation. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's less one-sided. So yeah. we hope to see and if you. Yeah. Next and if week. you don't want to know more about our album, uh, that's coming out next week on October 16th, um, if you can go to, uh, www.chicaandscott.com, we have a lot of um, information over there. Um, and, uh, Nexus Direct is, um, already pre-ordering our CDs. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, please do check those uh, sites out. Okay. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. We will be here again next week. Okay. Bye now. There it is. Bye.